another very lovely evening to all of you, my dear friends. I'm ever so thankful that you all could join me. We left off in our last study on the life of Christ with Jesus' ministry beginning in Jerusalem. He cleanses the temple. It's the first time that he does it. It's actually, he does that on a couple of occasions. But either way, then he goes to where John is located at the Jordan and his disciples begin to baptize people and john ends the last study with he must increase but i must decrease we now pick up in john 4 1 with our harmonizing the gospels when therefore the lord knew how the pharisees had heard that jesus made and baptized more disciples than john though jesus himself baptized not but his disciples he left judea and departed again unto galilee now coming up through unto Galilee, you almost had to go through Samaria. As you'll see, it's split up into three different sections right here on the map. You have Judea down here where the Jews were located. Then you had Samaria where the Samaritans are located. And then up here you have the Galileans, Jews. And it's a mixture of both, really. But you'll see that they have to go through Samaria to get there. Verse 4 goes on to say something rather peculiar, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Sychar, not located very far at all from the capital, which is Samaria. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour, which would have been midday, twelve o'clock to us. But they do believe that this is the actual well that Jacob of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that Jacob had built in this part of the land. There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Now this is, of course, the narrative of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well that has become famous since then. A lot goes on with this interaction between Jesus and this very poor ostracized woman it him asking for a drink right here kind of has this echo of what has always been true and jesus declares in matthew 25 for i was hungry and ye gave me meat i was thirsty and ye gave me drink i was a stranger and ye took me in there's an awful lot here and we see him asking this woman in whom he's really not supposed to be talking to as a jew He's not supposed to be talking to this Samaritan woman. She is not Jewish. But Jesus says, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now there's some history right here that is worthy of note. Why are the Jews and Samaritans so divided? Well, back in the time of King David, about a thousand years before this, David had a son named Solomon, and then Solomon had a son, and his name was Rehoboam. Well, Rehoboam was putting a heavy tax on all of Israel. Okay, now all of this would have been united at the time when Rehoboam first appeared, but it would be divided immediately upon Rehoboam taking the throne due to the heavy taxes and all of this, by the leader Jeroboam, whom would lead ten of the twelve tribes of all of Israel, and they would come to the north, and they would stick with the name Israel, and the Jews, that of Rehoboam, would maintain control of the south. It would be Judah and Benjamin, located in the south, and all the other ten tribes up here in the north. Immediately after the division of the two kingdoms, Jeroboam changed the worship of the Israelites in 1 Kings 12. No longer did the inhabitants of the north travel to Jerusalem to offer sacrifice and worship at Solomon's temple. Instead, Jeroboam set up idols in Dan and Bethel. Dan would have been located furthest north, and Bethel would have been located right here at the south. So they would have been worshiping idols instead of coming down here to worship the true God. After Israel's fall to the Assyrians, the northern kingdom would fall to the Assyrians. They began to intermarry with the Assyrians, contrary to Deuteronomy 7, saying that they shouldn't marry with pagans. This is why the Jews hated the Samaritans, as we see right here. This Samaritan woman saying, why are you even speaking to me? You Jews hate us. 
This is why the Jews hated the Samaritans as dogs or half-breeds, the Jews would call them. The Samaritans were also a continuous source of difficulty to the Jews who rebuilt Jerusalem after returning from ba the Babylonian captivity. Eventually, the religion of the Samaritans evolved to the point that they held only the Pentateuch, which was the first five books of the Bible, the five books of Moses, as being the law of God, rejecting all the books of, pro uh, now this is important, rejecting all the books of poetry and prophecy, like the Psalms and Proverbs and Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, all of those they reject. Furthermore, they claim their copy of the Pentateuch was the only original copy, a claim still made today by what few Samaritans still survive. Obviously, this was and is a claim rejected by the Jews. But notice how she immediately recognizes Jesus as a Jew without him having to say it. Pulpit commented, she would have known that he was a Jew by his speech, for the Samaritans were accustomed to turn the sound of shh into that of sss. And so when Jesus said in Jewish Aramaic, Tini Lishikoth, give me to drink, while she would herself have said Tini Lisikoth. So there's a distinction there. And notice she's also taken aback by him asking drink of her, not only speaking to her, but asking her for a drink. The expositor reads, why ask drink of me? The sense here might be that the woman was surprised that Jesus should use the same vessel she used. The Samaritans were so held in contempt by the Jews that the Pharisees, whenever they would travel up through like to Galilee and such, they would find the longer way around. They wouldn't even go in Samaria. They would always try to get around and take the longer way. But Jesus, as we see right here, he goes about from down here and starts to walk right up the middle. I mean, no, that's completely out of character for a, a Jewish teacher. But Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Barnes commented, the Jews used the expression living water to denote springs, fountains, or running streams in opposition to dead and stagnant water. Jesus here means to denote by it his doctrine or his grace and religion in opposition to the impure and dead notions of the Jews and the Samaritans. If you'll recall what the psalmist wrote, as the deer panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God, living waters. When shall I come and appear before God, the psalmist says, if this woman only knew. God is appearing unto her right now, right in front of her. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? You see, she still doesn't understand because Jesus is using a common expression back then. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He proclaims this publicly not long after he tells this Samaritan woman, but he reveals an awful lot to this Samaritan woman. It's, it's very um, extraordinary. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband and come hither. Meyer wrote, According to Lang, it would have been unseemly if Jesus, now that the woman showed a willingness to become his disciple, had continued to converse longer with her in her husband's absence. So this is customary. He says, We shouldn't speak any more without your husband. His desire, therefore, was in keeping with the highest and finest sense of social propriety. But the husband was nothing more than a paramour, or a lover, a boyfriend, or whatever. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that sayest thou truly. The bright days, Ellicott said, the bright days of joy and dark days of sin start flooding back to this woman's memory. The heart's promises made and broken, the sad days of death, which five times over had robbed her of a husband, or, worse than death, the sin which had severed the sacred bonds, like she committed adultery or something along those lines. The shame of the present shameless life, 
All these are at least hidden from a stranger. But his words pierce to the inmost thoughts and prove him to know all the acts of her life. She immediately knows something about this man because he's there's something about being in his presence. She just knows probably a look, his countenance, because she immediately says this in response. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Adam Clark commented, The time was now at hand in which the spiritual worship of God was about to be established in the earth, and all the Jewish rites and ceremonies entirely abolished. You see, Jesus means you don't have to any longer go to a temple or perform ceremonies. Now it's in the Spirit. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Martin Vincent commented, As the Samaritans received the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Moses' books, as the Samaritans received the Pentateuch only, they were ignorant of the later and larger revelation of God because they didn't have Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel. They didn't know any of these others. As contained especially in the prophetic writings and of the messianic hope as developed among the Jews, they had preserved only the abstract notion of God. You see, Moses, he, he, he did prophesy of the Messiah, but not in as great detail. But Jesus continues, The hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Now that's the first reason that he gives why people will worship the Father in spirit and truth instead of at a temple or something. He says, For the Father seeketh such to worship him. And notice also Jesus calls God Father. So much is revealed through Christ that is not revealed through anyone else. Jesus calls him Father. Ellicott, it is when men learn to think of God as Father that merely local and material worship must cease. The yearning of the human spirit is that of a child seeking the author of his being. The seeking is not human only. The Father also seeketh his child and seeth him when he is a great way off, like the Father did to the prodigal son. Jesus continues, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But the second reason is this, why men should worship him in spirit and truth, because he is a spirit. By this is meant that God is without a body, that he is not material or composed of parts, that he is invisible in every place, pure and holy. This is one of the first truths of religion and one of the sublimest ever presented to the mind of man. Almost all nations have had some idea of God as gross or material, but the Bible declares that he is a pure spirit. How do you think that he's eternal? Atheists miss, um, atheists miss this. They say, well, who created God? That's because they don't understand things of the spirit. God being a spirit is eternal. He's the only one in whom can create spirits. He's called the father of spirits. As he is such a spirit, he dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. A pure, a holy, a spiritual worship, therefore, is such as he seeks, the offering of the soul rather than the formal offering of the body, the homage of the heart rather than that of the lips." The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Now notice right here how she says the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior of the world, will tell us all things. Now pay attention to what she declares right here in just a minute. She says Jesus tells her all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Now this is astounding how plain of speech that Jesus is to this woman and not like unto even his 12 disciples, as we'll see. This is just, this is so remarkable of a verse. Vincent Stanton actually said, I think too there will be felt to be something not only very beautiful, but very characteristic of our Lord in his declaring himself with greater plainness of speech than he had himself hitherto done even to the twelve, to this dark-minded and sin-stained woman whose spiritual nature was just awakening to life under his presence and his words. There's something very deep and lovely about this. I believe that it's a matter of the heart. Jesus sees her heart and how 
susceptible that she is to hearing his words and how much that she desires to hear his words. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? I agree with F.B. Meyer. Why are you talking to a woman? For they had yet to learn the fact that Jesus rose above the rabbinical precepts, teaching that it was beneath the dignity of man to hold conversation with women and the directions of the law upon the subject. And you know, praise God for that. They uh, try to accuse Jesus later on um, about the Sabbath. Why are you healing on the Sabbath? You're not supposed to do anything on the Sabbath. Jesus says it's better to show mercy on the Sabbath. Which one of you don't show mercy on the Sabbath to some in the ditch and all of this? He gets into the love aspect and praise God that Jesus puts all of this grace and love and mercy and the weightier things above those of ritual and ceremony and, and just the strictness of the law. Jesus says love. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, as she just met the kindest man that she has ever known, whom shown the most mercy, and to which any other Jew would never have even spoken to her. And one can see the excitement in this woman. She says, you all have to come and meet this man. Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Now what is believed by this told me all things that I ever did was something about Christ's presence let her know that he knew everything about her. I'm certain that he had something about him, not scary or terrifying, but you just knew that being around him, you were around a being that was totally above all others that you had ever met. I'm certain that something was seen in his eyes that wasn't in others. John 4.30 Then they went out of the city and came unto him. So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. So during these two days in Samaria, John the Baptist is taken and cast into prison. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John Baptist, and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias, Philip's wife, and whom Herod took, therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. So Herodias wanted to kill John immediately, but that doesn't quite happen. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and a holy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. So Herod, the ruler of Judea at that time, he is being preached the gospel by the man he just imprisoned, John Baptist. And with that, we leave off for today. Thank you all for joining me. We'll try to pick up in part seven, Lord willing, in a couple of days. Thank you all. God of peace be with you. Amen.